Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with legendary jazz pianist Harold Mayburn. Over the course of our conversation, this brilliant jazz legend discussed his roots in a town celebrated for bringing the world quality musicians, Memphis, Tennessee. He talked about moving on to Chicago after Memphis, then on to New York City, and all of those cats that influenced him along the way and those that he played with as well. No one held a greater influence than the great Phineas Newborn Jr. He discussed playing with Miles Davis, Wes Montgomery, and most of the other jazz luminaries that were a part of the 50s and 60s New York City scene. For the past 35 years, he has been a jazz educator and continues to make all of that memorable jazz. He's a testament to longevity, consistency, and being one of the nicest cats on the planet. Please dig this interview, my friends. How are you, sir? Okay. Good. Hey, thank you for taking a little time to talk with me today. I appreciate it. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start off here right off the bat and ask you, what has been going on lately as far as projects, teaching, um, any live gigs? Uh, yeah, I'm going into the uh, uh, the Smoke Jazz Club on Tuesday for 10 straight days. We've been doing that for years with Eric Alexander and different guests. It's called right. Countdown to Cold Train. Cool. And let me go back to the beginning of your life here to kind of uh, weave together a tapestry for the audience. You were born in Memphis, Tennessee. Talk to me a little bit about growing up and how you acquired this love of, of music and specifically jazz. Well, I didn't, this sounds fun. I didn't acquire it. It acquired me. I'm self-taught. I started when I was 15 and a half years old. Okay. You know, I never studied piano, uh, had piano lessons and stuff like that. And uh, one day I heard this little girl playing a song on, on all the black keys. And uh, I don't know the real name, but all over the country it's called I Stuck My Dolly, D-O-L-L-Y, in the mud. And she <laughs> played it, and I went and played it. And uh, and from there, then uh, Professor Matthew Garrett, who's Dee Dee Bridgewater's father, was our band director. You know, he he was a trumpet player, and he taught me, Book of Little, Frank Strozier, Hank Crawford, Charles Lord. Lewis Smith, Isaac Hayes, and a few others. And then he kind of persuaded me to try to see if I could learn how to play some chords on the piano. You know, and to this, to this day, I don't know how it all happened. Well, I guess it's, it's a gift from God. And then I started learning a few songs, and uh, from there on, I just played a few gigs around Memphis as best I could, mostly blues, because they didn't want you to play no bebop. And, and, and you know, they wanted music where people could dance, you know. Yeah. So then I went to Manassas High School where Frank Strozier was going, who who's been my closest friend, close close because of the fact that we've been knowing each other longer than we knew George Coleman and other people we met, you know. And so when I went to Manassas High School and he said he had a, his mother and father had a piano and at that time I said, What am I gonna do? I don't I can't really play I knew about one or two songs. So fast, so long story short, so we started playing a few little gigs around around there until 54. Then I moved to Chicago, and he moved to Chicago because he was going to school there, you know. Yeah. So that's basically what was happening in that city during that time. Well, and it mentioned that you started out on the drums and moved to the piano. Why didn't the drums stick? Well, I wanted to play an instrument. So after the drums, I was playing the drums. Well, I wasn't playing drums, jazz. I was playing in the marching band. Gotcha. Because, like I said, during that time, I didn't know anything about any jazz and stuff, but I played drums in a marching band. So then I switched to trumpet, but I couldn't really get a good sound out of it. So then when I went to uh, to Manassas, they uh, put me on the, bar the euphonium baritone horn. And then that's how that happened. And that's when I started kind of getting into the piano a little bit. Right on. Yeah. Speaking, of the, speaking of the piano, Phineas Newborn Jr. has been... An in, a huge influence on you. Talk to me about why he cast such a spell on you. Well, Phineas New. When I talk about Phineas Newborn Jr., it brings a tear to my eye because that's a that's a soft spot with me. Because Phineas Newborn Jr. And listen to me carefully. Is the most underrated, unappreciated, put down musician, piano player ever lived, except by a few people. First of all, Phineas Newborn Jr. never worked anything out. When you listen to anything he played, up tempo what, he put his hands on the piano and it came out. He didn't have to practice 
two hand stuff or anything. He was a true musical genius. That and when I heard somebody play that, when I first heard him play, it was another pianist named Charles Thomas, who was a legendary around Memphis, Tennessee, played like Bud Powell. But he told me he said, "Look, if you want to play piano, I want you to check his name is Finus. He was born Finus, but." He, they changed his name when he came to New York, you know, for like publicity. You know how they do it. They would move the stars and stuff. But oh, when yeah. I heard him play, the first thing he did was play Taboo with his left hand by Art Tatum. And even though I didn't know much about music, I, I had enough common sense to know that it's impossible to play the piano like that. So when I heard that, that motivated me for the rest of my life because I said, that's what I want to do. I knew I would never do it the way he did it, I'll do him, but he inspired me even to this day. He was a true, like I said, he was a true, see, a lot of people don't know this, a lot of people don't care, but it's a musical crime the way the world, the music world treated that man, except for a few people. The few, i tell you who the few are, you know, Mr. Armand Jamal loves him, Mr. Hank Jones loves him, Mr. Thomas Flanagan, Mr. Walter Davis Jr., Mr. Stanley Cowell, uh, uh, even Oscar Peterson, loves him but oscar didn't say enough about him when he was alive had oscar talked about it more when he was alive when then his stock would have gone up see there comes a time when you can't speak for yourself that's why people have managers publicists agents and stuff like that you know what i'm saying yeah to to promote them but they dogged him they broke his heart you know and that will always bother me and and i don't know what i can do to straighten it out but he was a true musical genius and not only that with all that greatness, he never put anybody down. Trust me when I say this. He never, because he didn't talk much. In the 50 plus years that I knew him, he probably said 50 words to me verbalized wise because he didn't talk much. You know, yeah. James Wiggins was the only person that could get him to, to, I don't mean he had any kind of abnormality or anything, but he just didn't talk much, you know. Yeah. John Coltrane loved him. John Coltrane, if you look on the, on the album cover of Blue Note, that's Coltrane. Coltrane, this was before McCord time. Who are your favorite piano players? He said, Red Garland, Kenny Drew, Phineas Newborn Jr. First of all, he played tenor saxophone very well. Co- I'm talking about Phineas. He played, he could play tenor saxophone as well as saxophone players with a sound, everything. He played the trumpet very well. When he went in the army band, he played French horn and mellophone. He played vibes like Mill Jackson. He played the bass and he played the drums. So when you hear something, when you hear genius like that, man, you got to be, you got to be influenced by that and appreciate it. So when I heard that, right away he became my main influence because he also taught me how to orchestrate at the piano. It's the only few piano players that play like that. Number one is Jeffrey Keezer. You know, Jeff is more like Phineas than anybody because of the way he orchestrates and the way he utilizes his left hand, you know, with the contrary motion. Nobody plays contrary motion the way, in case you don't know what it is, if you do, contrary motion is the right hand going one way and the left hand going the other way. Yeah. He was a true, but here again, they dogged him. So if if you can do that to somebody like that, then, hey, it's, it's, no, it's no chance for, for uh, normal, regular people. You know, so when I moved to New York City, I mean, not New York City, I'm getting ahead of myself. When I moved to Chicago, and I was able to be around and see Clifford Brown and all the great people. So when I came back to Memphis, I always called Phineas Jr. because he's a junior like I'm a junior. So he said, play something for me. And I played Daoud. He said, what's that? He had never heard Clifford Brown. And I, I taught him Daoud. So if you go back to his first record, he recorded it twice. I feel proud that I taught him Daoud. That's how he learned how to play that song. But uh, they really, they really dogged him, man. You know. But wow. on a lighter note, uh, and he was always consumed with music. Like he'd be at a club, and I'd, I'd say, "Hey, Junior, such and such, you know, ask to show me something." And he's gone to another club, sit in. He he was consumed with music. You know, he'd go from club to club, and he might go to another club. He'd be playing the drums. He might go to another club if they had some vice, he'd be playing that or the bass, you know. But uh, it was a healthy environment, you know. Believe it or not, it was more music going on then than now. It's, it's sad that there's no jazz in Memphis now. The only time you hear jazz is a college that's called Rhodes College. They bring in people, but they, as far as I know, there's not one jazz club wow. in Memphis. And the history is, 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 
It's deep rooted. First of all, you probably don't know this. Jim and Lunsford, not sure you heard of him. Jim and Lunsford started the jazz program at our school, my Nancy's High School, back in the 40s. J.L. Wilson was playing fourth trumpet. Uh, Dee Dee Bridgewater was born, like I said, in Memphis. Her name is Denise Garrett. She's born May 27, 1950. Her father was a trumpet player. Aretha Franklin, if you heard of her, was oh, born yeah. in Memphis, Tennessee, not Detroit. Bobby Lyle, a great pianist who they call smooth jazz, but he played thing. He was born in Memphis, Tennessee. Morgan Freeman, a legendary drummer named Red Saunders, left in the 40s, moved to Chicago and became the house band of uh, Club DeLisa. There was a drummer named Richard Allen, we call him Pistol, left. He and Hank Crawford very close. Left and went to Motown, became the house drummer at Motown. That's Memphis, Tennessee. Not you know about Booker T and MGs. Maurice White, Verdine White, you heard those guys. Earth, Wind, and Fire, that's Memphis, Tennessee. Kurt Whelan, when you hear Whitney Houston with all those songs, that's Memphis, Tennessee. Wow. That's, that's the legacy, but people don't. But see, just so you know, people come and they think everything is okay. Memphis, Tennessee, so I say Chicago is the most underrated city in jazz, except for a few people, naturally, like my little brother, Herbert Hancock, who deserves everything, and Ruth Jones, who her name is Donna Washington, Nat Cole, Milt Hinton. But Memphis, Tennessee, when it comes to Memphis, Tennessee musicians, we've been completely ostracized, cast aside, ignored, put down. I'm just telling you like it is, you know. They had to dig and scratch for George Coleman to get the NEA Jazz Master for 2015. They had to... Some kind of petition. And I said, well, damn, when I first heard George Coburn in the 50s with Lewis Smith playing Charlie Parker, I thought he was a jazz bastard then. So, you see, we've really been cast aside except yeah. for a few people. It's nothing I can do to correct it. It's up to the public and the powers to be to put some recognition on it. Booker Little died too young. He died at 23. Frank Strozier, the most unique alto saxophone player since Charlie Parker, he put the horn in the case and said, don't call me, I'll call you. He, he's alive and well. I haven't spoken to him in about six years. But he got fed up, you see. So we've been completely ignored. But all of a sudden, all the saxophone players said, oh, where's Stroja, man? Oh, give me a break, you see. So I'm just yeah. throwing it out to you so you know the history of how sure. we've been completely ignored. Absolutely. We've never gotten our just do. Yeah, and you should. Let me ask you this. Your move from Memphis to Chicago... Well, I, thought I was going to the conservatory, but when I got there, my sister said the money is a little tight, but stay here and see what you can do, which was the greatest thing in the world for me because I got my my knowledge from the University of the Street. See, I tell people, this is street music. You don't have to go to school. I've been teaching a little school you probably heard of called William Patterson College. It's called yes. William Patterson University. Well, I've been there 35 years come January 1, 35 straight years. Wow. And some of my students say Eric Alexander, Joe Farnsworth, Bill Stewart, Tyshawn Sawyer, Roxy Cars, Freddie Hendricks, Peter Bernstein, Carl Allen, those are all my ex students. So wow. so what I did when I got to Chicago, I stayed there and I hung out, went to clubs, the guys embraced me, Andrew Hill, Muhal Abrams, and that's how I really kinda of got my and and Spike Lee's daddy, Bill Lee, who's a true one of the true greatest all around geniuses that ever lived. The only problem with Bill Lee is that he wasn't born with a big sound on the bass, and he always refused amplification, so you could never hear what he was doing. But if you could hear, but you can see his work through the movies, Spike Lee's movies, School Days, Mo Better Blues, and, and uh, Do the Right Thing. Those are all his compositions that he arranged for a big orchestra. So right being on. in Chicago would really taught me really how to learn music, how to read music, play the big band and stuff. So when I moved to Chicago, you know, I was I was ready for the most part to to step out into the real world, so to speak. Yeah. And speaking of the real world, you go to New York City in '59. That had to be a heyday at the time. Yeah. That, well, I tell I tell all the students and friends when I came to New York on November twenty first, nineteen fifty nine. I had five thousand dollars in my pocket. Now, if you go back, I don't know how old you are, but if you ask your your parents what five thousand dollars was like like that, that was a lot of money. You was almost considered semi semi maybe not rich but well to do because the the Sheraton hotels, those big hotels, were like fifty dollars a week. Yeah. So five thousand. You know, as a matter of fact, that was so long ago. The Ziploc freezer bags that we use every day. They weren't even on the market then. They were being tested. 
You wow. see, so I came to New York, so Cannonball Atlas, God bless him, rest his soul, he knew me from a group I was in in Chicago called the MJT Plus Three. I don't know if you ever heard of that group with Walter oh, yeah. Perkins, Bob Crenshaw, Frank Strode, and Willie Thomas. Well, we sold 10,000 records, and that was a hit record in, 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 in that time in, in uh, jazz, if you sold 10,000 records. So I had 5,000. I went to Birdland, so Cannonball Lester said, hey, big hands, that's my nickname by certain people. He said, you want a gig? He was standing in front. I said, sure. So he took me down to Birdland, Pee Wee Marquette, the little guy. I call him little guy. I don't like to say midget, but the little guy. He 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 always screened you. Where you going, Papa? Call that about a Papa. So Cannonball said, he's with me. He said, well, tell me something. This Birdland, you don't come walking down. Nobody know you down here. So I went in, and Cannonball introduced me to Harris Sweet Sellison, legendary trumpet player, who was Frank Sinatra's favorite trumpet player. Frank wouldn't do a day that Sweets couldn't make it just to play the little stuff he wanted. You know, he was Billy Holiday's favorite trumpet player. So he introduced me to uh, Sweets, and Sweets said, you want to sit down? I said, sure. Now, at this night, Tuesday night, there must have been 10 piano players in the house. 10. Cedar Walton, Bobby Timmons, Red Garland, Winton Kelly, Al Hay, Walter B. Because that was the spot. Hank Jones would come later because Hank was on staff at CBS across the street. So long story short, so Sweet says to me, Habit. Eight by introduction, eight flat. I said, well, what the heck is happening? I said, well, I know how to play eight by introduction. So I sat in. I, the song was called Getting to Be a Habit with You with, by Harry Warren. I sat in. From the second course I had, his sweet said, you got the gig. So he had me on the spot because Tommy Flanagan was leaving the band to go with J.J. So I got in the band with Sweet. So that was uh, Elvin Jones, Gene Raymond, Sweet, Jimmy, Jimmy Forrest, and myself. So that was a great time because I came up with all the great piano players, bar no, I mean all the great ones. And but everybody, like I said, treated me good because I didn't come there with an attitude. So they liked me. They would pull my coat to certain things and call me, you know. Then we would get together and practice a lot. Me, Barry Harris, Chris Anderson, who's a blind harmonic genius that taught her the Hancock, and Joe Zavinu. That's the way the climate was then. And keep in mind here again, and the negative side. A lot of those guys were strung out and junkers, but that didn't phase us because we still had common rider. You know what I mean? Those guys yeah. were, were more pure and hard than some of these so-called straight lifers that go to church every day. So I came in at the right time because I had a chance to be around all the great ones. Not some great ones now, but you're not going to outgrade them. That's what I said. <laughs> then we had the four younger guys. I called them the little big four. Herbert Hancock, Chick Corea, McCord Tyler, Keith Jad. That's the next group. And those guys, even to this day, you're not going to outplay them either. Right. But here again, it was camaraderie because we were young, but we respected our elders, you see. And that's Absolutely. why I got old because I was well-mannered. I knew the music. If I didn't know it, I would go home and learn it or go by the sheet music and learn it. But they they liked me because I knew the tunes. That's how I ended up playing with a lot of a lot of singers because after I did the day with Betty Carter inside Betty Carter, I started working at Berlin. Word kind of got around. Next thing I knew, I was playing with 10 different singers at Berlin throughout the years, including Johnny Harvey. That's how Coltrane got the idea to record with Johnny Harvey because we played off the Coltrane at Berlin. Let me ask you this. In 63, you, you had a stint with Miles Davis. What did you learn from somebody like Miles Davis? Oh, I learned a lot. The main thing I learned, and I used to tell Margaret Miller, rest his soul, I didn't understand it. I didn't know nothing about the modal sound. You know, with the clusters and all that, you know, the yeah. stuff that he was doing, kind of that Bill Evans was doing with, you know, Miles, that, that, you know, all that stuff. I didn't, I knew I could play, and Miles even said, "You sure can swing." I said, "Well, if I can swing, that's a compliment because Winton Kelly is always one of my heroes, and I followed Winton into the band, so that was the thing I took away from Miles how to play the clusters and the modal stuff." But we had six good weeks, you know, because when he called me, he didn't call me to say, you got the gig forever. He said, I need somebody to make the tour. Ron Carter talks about it on YouTube. If you go to Google, Ron talks about it. He talks about who was in the band. So that's the thing I learned about, learned from Miles, about how to bang, how to play the modal stuff, because it, it seems so simple now. But Margaret Miller said, well, a lot of piano players didn't understand that concept then. But, and I also learned how to present stuff, you know, how to present my music, you know, and that's what I tell a lot of the guys. Now, a lot of the guys, you go to the clubs, and they got these extensive piano charts, and they plan, and they can't figure it out, 
and the folks can't figure it out. They want to know why. And I try to tell them, man, you got to put some of them charts down. You know, Mr. Ahmed Jamal, he's, he, Miles knew how great Ahmed Jamal was 70 years ago. That's one of the foremost greatest pianists that ever lived to this day. It's just unfortunate. I don't know if you know, he, he has since retired. Mr. Jamal has retired, you know. Yeah. But uh, those are the things I learned from Miles. And he always supported me. Even after I left the band, he would be very complimentary to me. So we had a wonderful time. We did six, six weeks, and he, he didn't miss one night. He came to the gig on time. Let's play some music, you know. So, yeah. so I've been blessed to have, uh, even though I know I still haven't gotten my just total just to, but that's another subject for another time. But you got to be strong. The, the thing I have going for me, I'm very strong with my emotion and with my mentality. I refuse to let the system get me down, you know, because it's not a this is not a, a easy job being in the jazz because you got a lot of jealousies. You know, in jazz, well, just like in anything, you know. You know, yeah. can't say one thing to your face and the minute your back is turned. You know, like my dear friend Michael Dunn plays this song called The Backstab, you know, about OJ's, you know. But uh, that was a very informative time for me to play with Miles. And then I left there and I went straight with J.J. Johnson. And uh, after that, I just went from gig to gig because I always promoted myself, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, another musician that you spent some quality time with was the great Wes Montgomery. Talk right. to me a little bit about those those years and those times with him. Well, that was probably the most challenging year because of the fact that Wes Montgomery played everything and anything in any key. And here again, unlike me, Wes Montgomery couldn't read a note of music. And playing guitar, he played all that stuff in those what we call guitar keys like E minor. That's how I learned how to play a lot of songs in E minor, or E minor, F sharp minor, you know, those hard keys. And he would say to me, hey, Mayburn, if you look at the videos on those YouTube, he said, Mayburn, play this with me. I had to grab what he was talking about because he couldn't write nothing down. So that was great. And he treated me good. He paid me very well. And he, he was a tremendous human being, man. He practiced all day. His own, un, only, only unfortunate thing was he smoked cigarettes too much. And he didn't really watch his diet, you know what I mean. Mainly to see he didn't drink or no dope and nothing like that. But he just, like I said, too much cigarettes, you know. But here again, we were we were working a lot. And his brother, we were very close, Buddy Montgomery. And what would happen that I would fly to one because none of them liked to fly then. But when Wes had those hit records, you know, Wendy and all that stuff, that's how we end up in Europe. Uh, Buddy would drive to one gig, and I would fly to one. Then after I finished that gig. Buddy would drive to the next gig, then I would fly to the next one. So it was still a lot of work for both of us. But uh, like I say, uh, it's, it's nothing really easy to explain about Wes, except uh, he was a true genius, great human being, and, and the music was very challenging. Right. Swung, it made sense, you know. See, sure. here again, not to be redundant, a lot of guys write hard. Guys say, the guy really write hard, didn't he? He said, yeah, but why? Anybody can write hard, you know, but you want to write music that, you, that the people can relate to. Yeah. And that's why we've been very successful, you know. Thank goodness to my student, Eric Alexander. I've been with him over 20 years. I think I've made, all in all, I've probably been on 100 record dates and CDs with Eric Alexander. And he's not doing it because he wants to do something for me. He he needs me because of the fact that my my main source of music is that I love to be in a confidence on the piano. See, comping is an art form. Everybody can't comp. You know, you can't just put your hand, so that's been my forte. So when I'm not there, they miss me and need me, you see. So I feel, you know, honored and flattered that, uh, I, you know, I've been able to add something to his career, you know. But that has to be ultimately satisfying to have a student for two decades that you play with on a regular basis. Oh, it is, because at that time he never, he didn't know what he was going to get. He, You know, because when he came to class, first of all, I saw him as a diamond in the rough. Now, I can't speak for the other teachers out there. Because we got some great teachers at William Patterson. They used to laugh at the school because they didn't know the school. William, where's that? Now they're breaking their doors down trying to get in. But when he <laughs> came, Professor Rufus Reed put him in my ensemble. And when I heard him play, I said to myself, boy, this, this young man is an A student, you know. And what I did, I went out of my way to support him. He remembered that too. You know, I went out, I'm not saying the other teachers didn't. I went out of my way to support him because I knew there was something going on there and i told him learn all your standard songs and all the keys and uh go see george coleman he did he took two lessons 
And uh, the, as they say, the rest is history. We've been together 20 plus years. We've made so many records. Like I said, X, what tune is this from? He said, that's album such such. A lot of that. He know every song we played on every album. I can't remember. I know we recorded it. <laughs> you know, he said, oh, that's from It's All in the Game. I said, oh, this way. And he's allowed me to to record my music with him. Uh, most of the stuff we play is because of the fact that I either wrote it or I arranged it for him. You know, I said, well, let's play this standard this way, you know. So that's why I said we're doing the, the, uh, the, the Coltrane countdown. We've done that five straight years, you know. So I check in the hotel for at least six days because to play ten straight days and come home because I don't drive a car, come all the way to Brooklyn, that's a bit much as my, at my age, you know, and then it might get cold. So I'm looking forward to it. But he's been a he's by far my best student that I ever taught at that school. Well, and you've been there 35 years. Tell me what your teaching philosophy is. My teaching philosophy is, I'm glad you asked that. See, I don't get to school and say, what can I do? When I get on the, I have a bus ride. Once I get to Port of Thought, it's about four to five minutes. When I'm on the bus on the way to school, I got two or three songs in my mind that I'm going to have the private students of, of the ensemble play. And when I get to school, I say, write these chord changes down, or blah, blah, blah. And that's how I teach. Most of the stuff I do is strictly improvisational. I don't wait to get, so, oh, what can I, I was telling uh, David Wong, a very talented bass player. He said, I got to teach, but I don't know what to do. So I told him, I said, look, man, let the music come to you. Let your thoughts come to you. So I don't go there and say, okay, class, what can, I'm think, I'm constantly thinking about music. Like C. Watson used to say, my dear friend, music is always in you. You practice a lot of times and we're not at our instruments. We're practicing as we were walking down the street, Cedar used to love to whistle. Most of the songs I've written, I've written away from the piano, like Mr. Stitt, Edward Lee, Zebra for the Grace of, some of these songs, you may, because uh, I'm totally consumed with music. And that's how I pr approach my teaching thing. I go to school, and I know a lot of different kind of songs. So I said, let's try this. I don't wait till I get to school and say, uh, oh, what can we do? And when I get to school, I'm ready to hit. You know what I mean? Yeah. You've, you've had a prolific career. You've produced, you've taught, you've done so many things. What's been the secret to your longevity? Trying to take care of my health, trying to eat right and not do the things that other people did that I knew would, would, would hurt your body. You know, I never used dope. I smoked cigarettes when cigarettes were a penny a piece. This is during World War II days, but after, in 52, I stopped smoking. So that's the longevity, you know, uh, try to stay healthy try to eat good, you know what I mean, and, and try to, I don't I don't run, but I do a lot of walking. I used to run a lot. So that's the secret, you know, and then my mother lived to be 98, my sister lived to be 88, so hopefully it's some of us in the genes, but that's that's what I do. I try to think positive. I stay away from negative people. I have a little glass of beer every now and then, not 10 or 15 or 20. Every now and then I might have a, a vodka and orange juice maybe once a month, and that's really it. Yeah, be be positive and stay around positive people. Watch good things on TV. You know, I don't go to movies too much now because I hate to say it, you never know when some fool might start shooting up. Really, it's sad you can't go to a movie. Yeah, and I go is. out and listen to music, and that's that's what keeps me going. And try right to on. keep my karma right. You know, if you keep your karma right, because I finally believe in that, that if you do good, good will follow you. If you do one small thing bad, whether you believe in God, Jesus, Allah, whatever, it's going to come back on you. I know that for a fact. That's been going on for, for my 79 years. And, and to show you how blessed I am, I'm, I'm actually booked up until January 2017. <laughs> right on. You know. Right and on. Plus, when my wife was alive, the rest of so I took care of her. because my kids said, you know, Daddy, you, how you, I took care of her. Now somebody's taking care of me. Right on. Yep, it is karma. Let me ask you this. You've performed with everybody under the sun in the world of jazz. Is there anybody out there that you wanted to perform with and you didn't or that you do want to perform with now? Uh, well, there are some people. I'm trying to see. That's a good What Coltrane had asked me to sit in one night because McCoy was late. I knew the music. I said, no, because I respect McCoy, and I didn't want to, you know, whatever. But I did do the Coltrane play-along record. I'll show you how runs that is. I never played with Coltrane, but I'm the only piano player that did the Coltrane play-along record, you know, James Avesaw. So I look at that as a hidden blessing. I'm trying to see, is there anybody that – I wish I could have played with Charlie Parker. Yeah. And I wish I could have played with Clifford Brown, even though I knew Clifford Brown. 
But other than that, I've been very fortunate. I've been part of a lot of different piano groups. The piano choir with Stanley Cowell, seven pianos. I was I was instrumental in a group called 100 Gold Fingers of Jazz that was in Tokyo. So if you ever heard of that group, I was one that put that group together. I recommend, you know, so it hasn't been too many people that, you know, I, I wish I could have played with Charlie Parker. That's that's the one person. And I wish I could have hung out more with Errol Garner, even though I did know Errol Garner and Ahmed Jamal, because they both from Pittsburgh. Other than that, I've been very, I've been very blessed from that standpoint. However, you know, it wouldn't hurt to become a jazz master, you know, but that's not, uh, that's not up to me. That's, that's the power to be. Otherwise, I don't have any complaints because here again, not to be redundant, I feel that if I stay right and do what I'm supposed to do, if there's something I should get, the most high seat that I get it. And if I don't, then hey, but like I said, I'm booked up work-wise until, until January 2017 for, for every month from now until then, you know. Sometimes I even forget that I got the job, you see. <laughs> so I can't complain too much. Right, right on. Let me ask you this. As a man, I consider a master and a legend, and you've dedicated your life to jazz. Why do you love jazz? Well, here again, because it's, a, it's the most unique music on the planet. Even a great rock Rachmaninoff, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, classic music, because first of all, they said in order to play rock mono, you got to have big hands. Like, I got pretty large hands, so does Randy Weston. Rand, uh, uh, rock mono said that Art Tatum is the greatest piano player he ever heard in his life. He didn't say it in jazz. Oscar Peterson said, I've been trying to tell you, you dumb as that. So, uh, jazz is a unique art form. It's just unfortunate it's not appreciated in this country the way it is in the other countries. See, the Europeans love jazz musicians. But the Japanese and the Asian people idolize jazz musicians. The Japanese people have spent three hundred and eighty dollars cover charge. The next time you go out and talk to some of your students or whatever, they'll spend three hundred and eighty US dollars to come see Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter play. That's just the cover charge. Yeah. So I feel blessed because this is a blessed kind of music. It's just not as accepted in this country the way it should be. But thank goodness for the few fans we do have, you know. Yeah, so here absolutely. again, like I said, I'm blessed because I didn't choose the music it chose me. I think we all are born with some kind of talents that we can do, but it's up to us to know what it is. And when it comes, you might get a little sprinkle of it. you got to grab on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So once I found out I could play that one little song, I just took it from there. But when right I on. went to Chicago, I practiced 12 hours a day. See? So that's, that's my blessing. I'm blessed to be a so-called jazz musician, you know. And I have well, a new CD out. I don't know if you wear it, but it's called Afro Blue with five singers. I, okay, totally. so that's that's my blessing. That's one of the. That's the most to this day. That's the most important record that I've ever done. And thing about it, when you listen to that record, there was no rehearsal. Five singers, no rehearsal. Wow. No rehearsal. You don't see if you play for a singer, you rehearse five hours for a twenty-five minute gig. We had five singers when they came to the studio. I said, "This is what we ought to do." What are you saying? We conceptualized the whole thing in the studio. So I'm really proud of that. So a record like that should win a Grammy or whatever, a Tony or Emmy, but I know that's not going to happen, but I'm just saying. But yeah. that's, that's the most, I'm very inspired by that, by that CD. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this. When the children of the future open up the proverbial jazz book and they flip through the pages and they come to you, legendary jazz pianist Harold Mayburn, what do you want them to know about you? What mark do you want to leave on the pages of jazz history? Well, I guess they can say I, he did the best he could with what he had. That's the only way I can put it, you know, because like Cannonball said, a great person is judged by someone other than oneself. I never think of myself as being great at this. And when he said legend, I say like Howard Cosell say, yeah, I'm a legend in my own mind. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I feel funny even to this day when I say my student, because to me, I'm, I'm still a student myself. Art Tatum was still a student. You never saw. Ahmad Jamal has two Steinway Ds, too. You, the day you stop being a student, you might as well just go crawl in the hole and do something. So just, just that's the only thing I can say. I did the best I could with what I had. Right on. That's the perfect way, I think, to wrap everything up. Harold, thank you for opening up. Thank you. Up. 
Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over America, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Harold for his class, his grace, extensive jazz catalog, and a vault of great stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music music my friends neon jazz